It's good to see everyone here on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let's start off our services and turn to page 656. 656, take time to be holy as we all stand. today let's go to the Lord in prayer as we worship Lord we come to you and we thank you for all that you've done for us Lord we thank you for the week you've given us uh, the beautiful sunshine outside and Lord uh, we thank you that you are here with us and you've been waiting for us Lord as we come to worship you and Lord I pray that you would just speak to us uh, Lord that we would uh, put aside all the things that are going on in our lives and all the things that want to run through our mind and uh, Lord, that we would just focus on you, and Lord, that we would speak to you through our prayers, through our songs, but Lord, also that we would give you the opportunity, Lord, to speak to us, and Lord, that you would change us for having been in your presence. In your name we pray, amen. And for our mission moment this morning will be Judy McKee. Hello, good morning. Um, today, um, before I do the mission moment, I'd like to make a comment about Mother's Day. You know, today's Mother's Day. And I was thinking first thing this morning, back in the day in the 50s and 60s, early 50s and 60s, in church, we used to, uh, there's a lot of mothers here. You know, I was one of the children, family of nine. But my mother and all these other mothers, some of them had more kids than she did. But they had a, a, a comment about the one they wanted to know who had the most kids. And sometimes it was more than nine. It was a lot. And so my mother usually didn't win. But then they also, the, it was a big deal. They started having um, the mother that had the most kids in church that day. And 
a lot of people's children were in the military and everything else. But I wanted to ask that today. Who has the most kids here? Who has the most kids? Anybody have more than three? You don't nowadays, do you? Okay. Does anybody have three? Have you got three here? Well, I, there is someone here that does, but she's not mentioning it. <laughs> it's Miranda. She's got two in children's church and one in her belly. <laughs> Uh, carries it wherever she goes. <laughs> okay, never mind. I just wanted to talk about that because I remember that was always a big thing on Mother's Day, but there was a whole lot of mothers that had a whole lot of kids. <laughs> okay, anyway, I'm sorry, but the message, the missionary of the week is Luke and Leslie Montgomery. The summer before Leslie Montgomery started eighth grade, her church hired a youth pastor whose parents served as missionaries in Tanzania. Hearing them share what they had experienced literally changed my life, she said. I knew that summer as a 12-year-old that God was calling me to serve as an overseas missionary. This was in the sub-Saharan African peoples. Um, specifically, he was calling her to Africa, she thought. I came home and shared my calling with my church the next Sunday. Of course, no one was too concerned at that point. God isn't sending out too many 12-year-olds um, by themselves to go to Africa. She didn't feel ready as a teenager or a college student to go on a missions trip. Then she got married and had a baby, and there was a global, global pandemic. Leslie had no idea when her young family would bring the gospel to Africans who needed to hear it. One spring afternoon, God opened the heart of her husband, Luke, to this call to this call too. The family knew it was time. They were all in it. In March 2023, the Montgomerys and their two-year-old son Brock moved to South Africa to disciple university students. God has given us a heart for university students, and we know the incredible impact that can have on their friends, families, and communities, Luke said. Pray for the Montgomery family as they disciple university students who seek purpose and identity in Christ. And um, the passage for today is in Luke, Luke 11, 1. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Junie. And I'd like to reiterate Happy Mother's Day to everyone. Um, our announcements for this week, bulletins and prayer lists are on the tables at both entrances. Offering counters for the month of May is David Britt and Bob Hall. And again, we are collecting uh, items differently for the shoe boxes this year. Uh, we were asking you to give money, and uh, we will need that by September. And then when you do give the money, please use a plain envelope and uh, put uh, shoe boxes on there. That way it's a lot easier to count in the back. And, uh, and I want to read the bottom line. It says, thank you for all that you do. That's from Sharon and Beverly. Uh, very important, a WMU meeting will be moved to tomorrow, May the 13th at 11 a.m., so keep that in mind. The WMU meeting will be tomorrow. The, thank each of you for assisting us and making sure the lights are off at the end of the service and also for checking to make sure the outside doors are locked. God bless you each and every one. And we are looking for a librarian for the church. If you would like to uh, take this job, please talk with Bonnie and she can explain what is needing, needed in that capacity. All right, let's do our fellowship hymn and turn to page 688. Page 688 as we all stand. <laughs>
around and greet everyone this morning. Before we do our uh, special song today, <laughs> there is a couple of announcements that I did leave off here, so let me go ahead and announce those. Uh, our Sunday school materials are on the front row here and uh, open windows, uh, daily devotional, so if you need some of those, you can find them up here. And uh, next Saturday, May the 18th, from 2 to 4 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall uh, will be a baby shower for Miranda. And uh, she is registered at Target and Amazon, so keep that in mind. Next Saturday, May the 18th, 2 to 4. Sorry about missing those. All right, uh, let's do our special hymn today is 730. 730, very familiar hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus.
So this morning we do want to recognize, uh, and I'm going to call it women of influence, because years ago I realized that uh, not only uh, has my mom influenced my life and my wife influenced the lives of my children, but throughout my ministry and throughout my life, God has placed women of influence on my life. And uh, one lady kind of impacted me years ago, and she said, um, you know, Mother's Day is the day I don't want to go to church. And she said, because God's never blessed me to be a mother. And I real quickly reminded her that in my life and in my ministry at that church, uh, she had blessed me in a lot of ways. And so this morning, uh, I want to ask all of our ladies to rise and be recognized because uh, even if you are not a physical mother, you are a woman of influence in life. So if all of our uh, ladies would please rise at this time. Let me pray for you. Lord, we come before you, and I just thank you. Lord, I thank you for those that you have placed within our lives, Lord, that impact us in so many ways. And Lord, uh, even those that are not our physical mothers, but uh, have taken us under their wings and loved on us and taken care of us. And, uh, Lord, uh, lived out that example in our lives. And, Lord, I pray that you would be with these, uh, Lord, that they would just continue, Lord, to understand that they have a calling on their life. And, Lord, that you have given them something special. And, uh, Lord, I pray that as we look into your word today that uh, we would be reminded, uh, Lord, of the women of influence in our lives uh, including our mothers, but even others who have impacted us, and that we would remind them today uh, that we are very thankful for what they've done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Uh, so I'm going to begin with a story that I heard uh, several years ago, and um, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I am 99.9% .9 positive this has happened at some point. Uh, this gentleman said that... Uh, he got a phone call a few years before, and uh, his daughter had started first grade, and, um, you know, beginning of school, you fill out all those forms, and I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore, and so they had filled out all the forms, and they had turned them in, and first week of school, they called him, and they said, uh, Mr. Jones, we need to know what bus your daughter's supposed to get on. Now, guys, I don't know about you. I resemble this remark, this next part, very, very closely. He said, ma'am, at what point did it click with you when you were looking at that piece of paper that said mom's phone number and dad's phone number that you decided to call dad? And he said, but I will be glad to help you. If you will tell me what school my daughter goes to, I will come pick her up. And see, I re resemble that remark because years ago I was visiting a young man in the hospital and uh, they were introducing me to this lady in the room and she said, oh, I, I, we've never met, but I know who you are. And... I introduced myself, and she said, yes, I've been Kirby's teacher for two years, and uh, that's my youngest son. And uh, I said, well, he's doing good, right? She said, yes. Well, then we're good. Um, but moms are different, and this morning, uh, we're going to look at that. All throughout Scripture, you will find that there is a difference, and I believe that uh, truly, as I pray, that it is a calling uh, that you have as women uh, God made men and women different, and I don't care what anybody tells me. Uh, men and women are different in so many different ways, and I may end up having to just stand right here because this thing is driving me up the wall. So I'm going to just try to do off the microphone today. Uh, but the first thing that uh, the story that I go to when I think of women in Scripture and it's interesting, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, Paul is writing and he, and he talks uh, to Timothy and is writing this letter to him. And in verse 3, 
He says to him, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Now, women should be women of faith. And we find here as Paul is writing to Timothy, he reminds Timothy, you have a heritage, you have a history of faith because it, it first lived in your grandmother Lois. And then she passed it on to your mother Eunice. And then it's been passed on to you. And out of that, you have a legacy. And uh, to me, that's an important part. I uh, am blessed to, uh, I'm going to add another generation in there. I grew up on a family farm in South Georgia and uh, grew up looking there across the family farm. And obviously, I grew up in the home with my mother. But my grandmother lived uh, on the other end of the farm. And my great-grandmother lived on the other side of the pond from my grandmother. And I was blessed to grow up with my grandmother and my great-grandmother and to be able to go uh, to their house. And I can remember I'm, uh, one of the things when, uh, as different ones were passing away, and my parents asked me, and this was started kind of long before I became a pastor, they asked me, what do you want? And, and I said, I want the Bible. Because when I walked into my great-grandmother's house, she was almost always doing one of two things. She was cooking or she was reading her Bible. And if she was sitting, that Bible was sitting in her lap. And uh, it was pretty much torn all to pieces. It's got duct tape on it. And uh, I've had it in my, my church office for years. And I had people go, what's the deal with a duct tape Bible? And I went, well, it's torn and ragged, but God loves it. And because... She had worn it out, and there's notes all in it, and uh, she had written all kinds of things in it, and she just always passed on that wisdom to me, and she always uh, was giving me insight. And then uh, growing up with my grandmother being there, uh, but when I went and worked at the Marine base, uh, I rode to work with my grandmother. And there's a lot of things about that, uh, pros and cons, of working with your grandmother every day, and I literally interacted with her. We worked in the same office, um, but uh, I can remember driving to work one day, and I was really bad about doing this number. I would pop my knuckles, and I'm driving, and I had a stick shift, and for some reason I just took my fingers on that stick shift and just popped my knuckles. And my grandmother... <laughs> What are you doing? She said, stop. They're going to look like this. And she held her hands up. And I'm like, and she's like, stop popping your knuckles. I'm like, you could have nicely said that to me. You didn't have to, you know. But that was just her. That was, that was how she was. And uh, I love that. Uh, but out of that came a great uh, amount of conversations that we had about life and about God uh, every day as we rode to work together. Uh, Genesis 17, 15, and 16 says, God also said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. And I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. And I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Uh, when I think of Genesis 17, I think of what God was going to do with Sarah and the promise that he made. I believe that that promise is still to you as women. That he says to you, I'm going to bless you. And if you will raise my children, and you understand, sometimes we get this wrong. We call them our children, and I do that. Uh, I'm, I'm blessed with three boys, and I call them my boys. They're not really my boys. They're God's boys. God just gave them to us to raise and be a part of and to invest in them for him and to take care of them for him. But you are supposed to be women of faith because we look up to you. Uh, when I think of church, and people have asked me throughout the years, uh, so what do you think about women stepping into certain roles in the church? And I say it's because we as men haven't done our job. 
And women are women of faith, and they're going to make sure that the church succeeds. And that is reality around the world today, that women step in and make sure that church does what it's supposed to do because so many times we as men have not stepped up and done what we're supposed to do. But God has called you to be women of faith. God has called you to be women who pass on their faith. And you're supposed to be passing it on. In 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 3, it says, For I received, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. You are supposed to be passing on your faith. We find that uh, from Lois to Eunice and then to Timothy, that we're supposed to be passing on our faith, and you're an important part of that. But when I think of uh, all the years of ministry that I've been involved in and, and the women that have been willing to pass on their faith and share who Jesus was to them, to children. I, I can't imagine as I was kind of preparing for this sermon and I thought about my little country church that I went to in South Georgia and the women that, that taught me from day one, who invested in me. And I was blessed that my grandmother was one of my Sunday school teachers and my mom was one of my Sunday school teachers. But there were a lot of other women who taught me in Sunday school and I was there learning from them every week. And they were investing in me and praying over me and caring for me. And I think back a, a lot in my ministry, back to that little church and, and all the women who loved on me. But I've also been blessed that throughout my ministry of watching women share their testimony. Watching women love on not only children, but people, adults. And I encourage you with that because you never know those around you and what they're going through. And I believe with that, God has blessed you. God has given you a nurturing that God did not give us as men. You have an ability to see things and experience things and, and to care about things that we don't. And when I, when I look at just our sons and, and the difference between Kim and I, we, we see their relationships and Every now and then I know she gets frustrated because she says, well, the boys call you more. And I'm like, dear, you're welcome to be a part of those conversations, but they're not normally about life. They're about ball. And, you know, like we'll spend 30 minutes talking about different baseball or softball scenarios or basketball scenarios. And I said, your conversations are different than mine because your conversations are about life. And you you just as ladies, you see things differently. But with that, you have an ability to see needs, spiritual needs, greater than we do. And so I encourage you with that. That you would use that, that ability that you have to see things and to understand things. That you would do what God has called you to do. And that you would pass on your faith. Beginning with your children but not just to your children, to your grandchildren, and to others that you come in contact with. Because you have an ability to present the gospel sometimes different than we do. Because you see it different. You see people different. You see the word and the world different. Uh, interestingly, when you look at uh, how God has used us, um, if you read on in 2 Timothy, as, as Paul is writing the second letter to him beginning in verse 14 he says but as for you continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He's writing to Timothy, and um, when, you, when you look at what that means, and we get our understanding of discipleship from Paul and Timothy. But he says to him, you learn this. 
from a little bitty child, you learn God's word. And to me, that, that is our calling as parents. That's your calling as mothers and women of influence, that you're supposed to be teaching them. Uh, you know, one of the things I think we have gotten away from to some extent is all the little songs that I grew up with that taught God's word. All the things that, that uh, we used to do uh, to do that. And I will encourage you, if you're not doing uh, devotions with your family, you should be. Uh, we, uh, in the process of moving, uh, we had lost some books. And for ever, we were looking for those books, especially when our granddaughters were born, to be able to pass them on to them. Uh, but we, we had these little books when our, little boy, when our boys were little boys. Uh, and every night we would read one of them, and it had little ladybugs in the picture. And Kim can probably tell you if you want later to know this. Uh, but so we would read the Bible story that went with it and the scripture and uh, the questions that kind of came with it, and then they would get to find the ladybugs in the picture, and we would have a little competition. I know that's hard to believe, but... Uh, our boys would compete to figure out who could find all the ladybugs first. Um, but out of that, it was teaching them about God. And in the process of moving, we were opening boxes and trying to figure out what are we going to trash, what are we going to keep. And it was like, oh, there are the ladybug books. Uh, and so, um, but that ought to be a part of the process, that you are teaching them in everything, that you are teaching them God's word that you are finding resources to be able to help them understand who God is. As Paul says to Timothy, be thankful because you're blessed from your infancy, from the time you were a little bitty baby, that you were learning the Holy Scriptures. And remember who passed those on to you. And then he goes on with that section of Scripture that we know so well. And he says, because Scripture is to be used for teaching rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, I can promise you, when my mom got on to me, she normally quoted Scripture. And I was like, I don't need Scripture at this point. Just get it over with. But she wanted me to know, I'm not getting on to you just to get on to you. I'm getting on to you because this not only goes against my rules, this goes against God's rules. See, at that point, I didn't care about God's rules. I just, if, if you're going to spank me, spank me. Let's go. Now, you know, my mom and especially my grandmother, my grandmother was a switch person, if you don't know what a switch person is. She had a switch bush. Maybe some of you have missed the switch bush. I think we have a whole generation that has missed the switch bush. Switch bush was about life choices. Some of you will get this. Because it was, go get a switch. And on the way out to the switch bush, you had to make a life choice. Do I get a big one? Or do I get a little one? And see, through that, you kind of went through a few little experiments in life. Because if you got the big one, then they couldn't whip it as much. And every now and then, you'd get lucky and it would break. They didn't care. They just started using the little end. But if you got a little one, I mean, it, you would think it don't hurt as bad, but they'd use it a lot. I mean, it would... Shoo. About life choices. And they would always go, you know, the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child. Had that one down pat. But it was about rebuking and correcting. But Paul also tells Timothy, and I think he reminds us, that it was about preparing for righteousness. And righteousness is one of those big words that in essence just means right living. I want you to live right. And ultimately, that is our goal as parents. When we love our kids, we want them to make right choices. We want them to do right. We want them to, to live right. But you understand, as you have heard me say, that doesn't just happen. That means an investment of our time. 
That means us raising them right. That means us telling them. Here's what God's word says. Helping them understand that God has a plan for their life. And helping them understand that, that this is what God's word says. And here's why God's word says it. In my ministry and in my life, I've had a lot of people go, you know, I, don't, I just don't get all the thou shalt nots that you guys have as Christians. I don't, I don't get the Ten Commandments. Because they're all about things we shouldn't do. And my answer is because it's about living right. You know, thou shalt not kill. You get that one? That one's kind of obvious. It's not good to kill other people. Thou shalt not lie. Because you want to be a man or a woman of your word. You want to be somebody that people trust. And it's interesting because when you look at the Ten Commandments and you follow that up with Jesus' greatest commandment, his was that I want you to be able to live right. I want you to be able to make right life choices. And throughout life, that's what I've tried to do with my boys. It's not only help them to make an immediate choice, but to figure out how this fits in the long term. How, do, how does this fit into the rest of life? And again, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be using God's word to help them make right life choices. Because ultimately, all of those thou shalt nots, God ultimately says, I just don't want you to go through struggles. I think one of the, you've heard me say, one of the greatest things that we miss out on is we're not real good at telling our children the mistakes we made. We're not real good at saying, look, here's what I did, and I don't want you to follow in my footsteps. I want you to make better choices than I made. Because here's, here's the problem that comes out of it. And when you go back to all of those things in the Bible that God tries to keep us from the problems of going through, it's because he loves us. And he put in his word scriptures, stories that help us make right choices. And that's what we're supposed to be doing with our children, our grandchildren, those people who have influence in our life. And then verse 17 at the end, he says, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul says to Timothy, what your grandmother and your mother were teaching you as a little bitty baby. That was preparing you for what God had for you. That was preparing for the work that God had for you. That you would be thoroughly equipped with the knowledge of Scripture and the knowledge of right living to do what God's prepared you to do. And that's interesting to me when I read that every time. Because when you're holding that little baby, you have no clue what God's going to do with them. Like you can't look at a little baby and go, this is going to be a, you fill in the blank. Because you don't know. I'm going to give you a little hint. You can be looking at, at your teenage son or grandson or daughter. You still don't have a clue what they're going to be doing. What God's prepared them for. And that's what makes it interesting. Because God says, you invest in them, and I'll take care of it. Because I have a plan. I have a plan of how I'm going to use them, what I'm going to do with them. And you don't even need to know the plan. You just do your part. You equip them. You give them scripture. You give them right living. You give them right choices. You rebuke them. You correct them. You train them. And you use God's word to do all that. Because I have a plan for them. It's interesting. Because I've looked at my boys and as I was preparing this this week and thinking through, I... 
am still wondering, God, what's your plan for them? Because I don't think God's done. I mean, they're still young men. What's your plan for them? Now, we're preparing at the 4-H Center, we're preparing for camp in three weeks, and I can't even imagine what that's going to be like. Um, you know, I did a food order this week with one of our food companies, and um, they brought the truck in Friday morning, and we unloaded for two hours, and I was like, I kept looking, how much more you got? And he's like, oh, I ain't even got to the frozen food yet. Okay. I can't imagine what it's going to be like with 200 children. As I was thinking through this, I thought, and when, you know, when they either get out of those cars or get off that bus, God's got a plan for them. And we're a part of that plan, whether we realize it or not. When you invest in the life of a child, whether it's your child or your grandchild or your niece or your nephew or some kid that lives across the street, you're investing in their future. Because God has a plan for them. And I'll remind us, your grandchildren, your children, your nieces, nephews, those across the street, no matter how old they are, you're still investing in them. Because you don't know what God's plan is. Sometimes we take the long road to God's plan. Sometimes we don't just go, okay, God, I hear you. I'll do that. Sometimes we go all the way around the mountain to get to where God wants us to be. And he reminds us and he reminds you as ladies, you're supposed to equip them for God's plan, for God's work, because God is going to do some incredible things and is your part of the process. When you look at that, it also says in Ephesians chapter 5, and this may be the hardest part of being especially a mother. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. However, each of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Interestingly in Scripture, God never calls the wife to love the husband. We'll, we'll talk about that a little more in a coming sermon. Does it? Never calls for you to love your husband. It says respect him. And I've often said it's easier to love than it is to respect. It's easier to love than it is to respect. But he never calls you in Scripture to love your husband. That comes out of it. But he calls you to respect him. Throughout the years, I've been asked, well, how do you respect a man that's not worthy of respect? Because God created him. God's not done with him. If you go back, 2 Timothy 3, 17, God's still got a plan. And you're called to follow that. And I think part of the way that you live out that life is living out that role. And again, sometimes that's not real easy. I get that. Sometimes it's not easy to do the hard parts of God's word. I close out with, I reckon it would be a poem. Small handprint on the wall is the name of it. One day as I was picking the toys up off the floor, I noticed a small handprint on the wall beside the door. I knew that it was something that I'd seen most every day, but this time when I saw it there, I wanted it to stay. The tears swelled up inside my eyes. I knew it wouldn't last. For every mother knows her children grow up way too fast. Just then I put my chores aside and held my children tight. I sang to them sweet, sweet lullabies and rocked into the night. Sometimes we take for granted all those things that seem so small. 
like one of God's greatest treasures, a small handprint on the wall. If you haven't heard this, I'll remind you of this. It goes by really, really, really fast. Can I get an amen? Amen. Faster than you ever think. Um, I was sitting there yesterday, and a friend of mine was like, you're mellow today. What's the deal um, at Kirby's ball game? And I said, because we're coming to the end, like uh, end of a journey. And, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and just thinking, what's next? God, what's next? And, and I think I know what's next. That doesn't mean I know I know what's next. But I'll remind you, every day special, whether that's with your parents or whether that's with your children or those of influence in your life. And again, as I was working through this, I thought of a lot of different women in my life that God has placed in my ministry that have helped me, that have loved on me. Uh, When we were in Johnson City, I had one that would come up to me every week, and she would go spin around. And the first time she did it, I was like, what are you doing? And she was like, last week your collar was messed up the whole time you were preaching. And she's like, I'm going to be your mama. I'm going to check you out before you get up there. So every week I'd walk up and, do this so she would check me out and you know it's interesting and it and it just kind of became a little funny thing but it's those things and that's why I say those women of influence because it's not just your children and your grandchildren and again maybe God's never blessed you with children but that doesn't mean there aren't those people that you have influence over that you can love on that you can care for no matter how old they are. I actually promised her when I left, she was like, so when I die, you're going to come back and do my funeral, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. She said, uh, well, just know I've already, I've already preached it. And she said, and I've got the paper for you of what you're going to say. And I'm like, you know, you know I'm not going to read what's on that paper. And she said, if not, I'm coming back to haunt you. And I'm like, you've haunt me every day. What is that? It's that influence. But as I stand here today, it's those people that are in our lives. You know, I think of my grandmother, my great, or my grandmother on both sides, and my great-grandmother, and my mother, and my wife. And all those women of influence in my life that have impacted who I am, don't take those for granted. Don't take for granted, ladies, the influence that you play in the lives of those around you. Because Satan would love to get you to think you're not making a difference, but you are, I promise. So remember that every day, not just today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come before you. I thank you. I thank you for those that have had influence in my life. Those that have impacted me, challenged me, rebuked me, corrected me, taught me your word. Those that have prepared me for life. Lord, I pray that today would be a special day. Lord, in the lives of our mothers and our grandmothers and those women of influence, and Lord, that we would take the opportunity to say thank you to them. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would just use us. Lord, maybe there's one here today that is struggling with your plan for their life. Lord, it's not just something that teenagers go through. It's, I believe, something we go through throughout life. Lord, I pray that you would touch them. Remind them that you have, since infancy, been working on their life. You've got a plan. And you have placed people in their life to point them in the right direction. Lord, I know that there are some that have run from you. And Lord, I pray that 
if there's one today in this room that the Lord has been running, that they would say, today's the day. Lord, we thank you and praise you for all that you've done for us, all the, the women that you have placed within our life to influence us. In your name we pray, amen. If you don't know my Jesus, I'd love to share my Jesus with you. Maybe this morning in the process you realize that God does have a plan for my life. And maybe you're that one that's been running from that plan. And I would encourage you to say to God today, God, I'm here. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to be faithful to you. You be faithful and obedient to him. If you need me, I'll be right here. Our hymn of invitation this morning is page 602. 602, as we all stand, I have decided to follow Jesus. Thank you.